Cause you're listening to Jams and Tea You won't see the show on your TV So we talk about things musically Cause you're listening to Jams and Tea you're listening to Jams and Tea Hey, welcome to the record club I don't fucking know what that fucking I thought you were was. about welcome. to launch I thought you were about to launch into the Spongebob theme song <laughs> 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 yeah, anyway. It's in a podcast oh. under the sea. All right, today we are talking about on this week's record club, we are talking about August recommended record. We are going to be talking about Mike Oldfield's tubular bells. August, why don't you tell us a little bit about Mike Oldfield, the, this record, and why you decided to pick it? So, Mike Oldfield, progressive rock legend this album tubular bells has a reputation that far precedes it it is in the uk the second best selling studio album ever uh as in the only other studio album that beats it in terms of sheer numbers is a simon and garfunkel record which should give you an idea of just the saturation point of this record but I'd say, and I'd say nowadays, most people, despite the incredible cultural saturation of this record, nowadays only know it for about the first 90 seconds, <laughs> which became very popularly used as the theme song for the 1973 film, The Exorcist. Um, and it was basically from that catalyst, I decided, well, I want to talk about this record, A, because of like name recognition, and B, because I think it will give us an interesting avenue to explore, uh, I mean, instrumental progressive rock first off, and second off, an avenue to explore how context can warp a piece of music and change public perception of it. So. Uh, Okay, well, I'd like to leap in first on, on this, oh, yeah, the, for this on this occasion, if you want, because uh, I get definitely the Exorcist connection, and I know for a fact that Serge is going to talk about that, but I don't have that association with this album. I'm one of the few people, oh. maybe one of the few people here who don't. I definitely, obviously, have seen <laughs> the Exorcist. Yeah, I was going to say, like, what I the heard, fuck? I've definitely I seen two Bueller bills before it was cool in the Exorcist sense. I mean, this, I mean, it is. Yes, I heard two meter bells when it was before it was in the Exorcist, like the months after the, it came out. Yeah, like for those a, two yeah. months, it wasn't yeah. in the but Exorcist. Look, what I mean is um, that I had heard this album before I saw the Exorcist many times, mm -hmm. and I'll get into. So it's still weird. I want you to know that. Yeah. So my dad, a huge fan of Mike Oldfield, played his music heaps as a kid. Um, so I actually had exposure to this record and many of his other records when I was very young um, before I saw The Exorcist. Um, and so, yeah, so I, I have an association and a history with this record that's divorced from that movie. So I'm, which I'm pleased to have because um, you can all then, some of you can speak to that if you want to, if, and I don't have to get involved in that. But, um, but yeah, so this album is obviously a classic. Um, and, and August has given a little bit of context for it, and I'm pleased to say I can give a little bit more so we can kind of flesh out what this album's place in history is and then talk about it um, in terms of the actual content. Um, but I'm going to start off by, I'm going to start off my review by, with a blanket statement that I think is, is quite important to establish from the off as someone who has listened to almost everything that Mike Coldfield has made. Mike Oldfield has five albums that are better than this. <laughs> but for better or worse, Mike Oldfield has no records remotely as well-known or as influential as this. And he does still have plenty that are beloved by many, especially in the UK. This was far from his only successful album and was in fact the beginning of an illustrious career. Um, Oldfield is a proper wonderkind a child genius with a natural proficiency at basically any instrument he picked up. He recorded this album at 19 years of age. Uh, and he, his talent is reflected in the fact that he is 
playing no less than 20 different instruments on this album entirely himself. Uh, least of all the titular instrument, which he basically succeeded in making a household name. So while I think this is far from the best cohesive whole record, and not even the most interesting Mike Oldfield album narratively, it still has plenty to talk about and engage with. And I've heard this thing countless times in my life, mostly as a young child. Um, but despite that, there are still plenty of elements of it that surprise me coming back to it now with some distance, even though I feel like the whole thing is kind of ingrained into my head from moment to moment. Um, one thing that did surprise me coming back to it after not having heard it for a few years is how plainly and clearly it is influenced by Jethro Tull, who, re oh, yeah. who released their seminal albums, Aqualung and Thick as a Brick, um, two and one years prior to this, respectively. And both of which I think are uh, as revelatory of a listening experience and probably even more musically interesting than this is, which is not to de denigrate this record, but simply to give it, place it in a particular context relative to the things that influenced it, which are few, and the things that it influenced, which are many. <laughs> um, Most. So... And yet, despite the fact that I think we probably can all agree this is not exactly the most consistent album of all time uh, in terms of the progressive rock genre, it, it, it perseveres. Um, Tubular Bells, as um, August has stated, is a ri ridiculously successful record in the UK. It is, um, needless to say, the highest selling progressive record in British history, I believe, or at least within the 70s. It's entirely possible that Pink Floyd sales might have caught up to them in the decade since, but I'm not too sure. It's certainly in the 70s, it was the highest selling progressive album. And that was basically the British kind of blue in the sense that every household had a copy. And I can say that because in the 70s, when New Zealand was essentially just mini Britain in terms of cultural perception from the outside, it was true here as well. Both of my parents who come from diametrically opposed families in a lot of different ways, had copies of Tubular Bells in the household when they were teenagers. This fucking thing just was everywhere, which is curious because now I feel it's less remembered more widely in the culture, which I honestly think is more of a reflection of the fact that it just never really took off in the US in the same way that other British prog outfits did. Um, so I don't think the fact that it's less talked about than the records of, say, Pink Floyd or Yes or Genesis are, is a reflection of quality as much as just a reflection of the weird crossover appeal that those had that this didn't, for, for whatever reason. Or it did, but it was much more limited. Um, and I think also that's a reflection of the fact that this has a much more kind of pastoral folk influence mm. than some of those other records, and that's a particular aesthetic and style that didn't necessarily have a lot of crossover appeal in the US. Anyway, um, also just once you dig into this thing beyond that famous outro that was in The Exorcist, it's actually really naughty and weird and ugly and rough and all kinds of brilliant except the kind of brilliant that's immediate. There are frequent guitar passages, uh, particularly in the first part of the two-part um, piece, that are loud and scraping and grating, almost proto-punk in sound to a certain extent. Um, and they brush up against much more muted sequences of more organically pretty instrumentation in a way that's downright unfriendly and will likely have fans of one sound not particularly connecting with the other um, necessarily. Um, so it's kind of weirdly knotty and unfriendly in a way that is um, less talked about, I think, um, than it should be. Uh, for lengthy passages, especially in this first part, which uh, I'm going to have a hot take and say that I think that while the first, I agree the first part is the standout of the two parts in terms of significance, I actually think it's the least, the least consistent and the least holistically well put together of the two parts. But it is still a masterpiece. Um, the, um, where am I up to? Um, for lengthy passages in part one, it feels like Mike is simply trying to incorporate as many different instruments as possible with any attempt to thread these different sections together, feeling almost like a mere afterthought at points. Until, of course, you get to the great finale of part one, which is this wonderful, um, has starts with this wonderful 
fantastic looped bass line and and the addition of instrument after instrument after instrument and i get this huge smile on my face every time the voice of viv stanchel comes in saying grand piano um and it's just mandolin it's just one of those things that's just like because i guess of the connection i have with it as a kid but also because of how classic that moment feels uh it really makes me smile uh and then it just i just my smile gets wider and wider as more and more of these instruments are piled on uh, and just they just reiterate that glorious melody over and over and over. Uh, it's brilliant. I love it, and it's it's truly does feel significant and and momentous uh, in a way that really good classic prog should. Um, part two is both less um, immediate and less remembered, um, but also I think in many respects it's kind of underrated. Uh, weirdly enough, even though I do have some some issues with it it has plenty of great stuff as anything that oldfield did in this period was bound to by the sheer force of his creative flow um the opening section in particular of part two is pure oldfield pastoral gorgeousness in fact i think it's one of the prettiest sections of music he ever recorded the way that it lilts and ascends and descends and circles back around was no doubt hugely influential on waves of instrumental rock bands in the decades to come i think you can even hear elements of the guitar arranging and the progressions here in a band like godspeed you black emperor for instance who we just talked about on our main episode this week and then when the choral vocals come in around eight minutes in, you can instantly hear where an artist like Sufjan Stevens has taken from this record. Though, interestingly, as soon as that particular part becomes comfortable, you get this blaring and, and glorious organ-led section that begins the complete upending of this track's initial beauty and moves you gradually towards the infamous caveman section that begins about 12 minutes in. Um, the story of how and why these caveman vocals were um, recorded by Oldfield is quite funny. In fact, I will, I had the Wikipedia page open, I'll bring it up and, and, and share some of that because I think it's interesting how that was recorded. Um, basically, one piece of context as well that I haven't given is that this record was a massive success for Virgin at Records, the record label headed by Richard Branson, who, and basically that label became ineffably and forever tied to this album because it was this was the album that blew it up and essentially in a weird way a huge amount of Richard Branson's wealth and success can be attributed to this album specifically which is an interesting thing that doesn't necessarily get talked about a lot but anyway Richard Branson basically what Mike Oldfield did with his demos for this record is he took them around record labels trying to get signed trying to get someone who would give him enough money to realize the vision of it and he was continually and compete and and continuously uh, rejected um, for obvious reasons you know where's the commercial appeal in this there's not enough vocals in it what's the how are we going to sell this in 1973 to the British public um, but Richard Branson young uh rearing to go entrepreneur with a new record label took a risk on it and said hey I think this might be cool I think we might be able to do something interesting and cool and successful with it and the rest is history what's also interesting about the rest of Mike Oldfield's career is that he continued releasing records for Virgin Records up until the end of the 80s uh, including all of his greatest albums um, and but there was continual pressure from Branson to uh, continue to replicate the success of Tubular Bells, which Oldfield would repeatedly push against again and again and again that you see in the, the, his discography progression. Uh, he did eventually start to move towards a pop territory in the mid 80s. And honestly, he actually managed to do that really well, in my opinion. Some of his best stuff is stuff that takes the pastoral prog of this and tries to shape it into pop songs. Um, and then yeah, I also want to take this opportunity to shout out my personal, not my personal favorite, but probably the Michael Field record I have the biggest connection to, which is 1990s Amarok, which is a one hour single piece of music for the CD era that is just awesome and blistering and weird and, and, and wild. Um, but Mike Oldfield's, while I'm on a tangent, Mike Oldfield's best album um, that I enc encourage everyone to check out is, is Amadorn, which I think I'll get to a bit later on in my notes anyway. But just to take a back step, that's some context about um, how this record came to be successful and the impact that it had 
uh, specifically. And so getting back to part two and the caveman vocals of part two, one thing that Branson did do in the, during the recording process for this record is demand that there be more vocals on it um, and said that I need you, part one's great, well, I'm happy to let you have part one, but you need to put some vocals on part two. You need to give me something I can sell in part two. And so uh, Mike Oldfield got, I believe, got really drunk and pissed off and just ran into the studio and started shouting into the microphone. So you want vocal? You want vocals? I'll give you fucking vocals. He had a whole bottle of whiskey, as the story goes, from the studio cellar and demanded the engineer take him to the studio where he, quote, screamed his brains out for 10 minutes into a microphone, leaving him so hoarse that he couldn't speak for two weeks afterwards. The cool story about this is the engineer ran the tape at a higher speed while recording so that when it was played back, it ran at normal speed and the pitch of uh, Mike's voice dropped and produced the sound that you hear in the midsection of part two of Tubular Bells called the Piltdown Man vocals. Um, and I think this is an interesting segment of um, music on the record, certainly a contentious point because it's like so abrasive and jarring when these vocals come, it's like, what the fuck is happening? And it's definitely a, a uh, an aesthetic and musical decision that I have gone back and forth on over the years. But I do think that while I'm not entirely convinced it works, I think that the way that part two is structured so that it kind of goes from this beautiful pastoral music, slowly moving into this eerier section where those vocals sit is really well done. And I actually think that regardless of whether it works as an artistic decision, uh, I think you can really admire the uh, idea behind it, the idea of moving through history in this piece, starting from a pastoral beautiful setting, which is before humans have plundered the planet, and then getting the ugly industrial perversion of um, people uh, with this caveman section. Uh, I think that that through line in terms of the arrival of humans onto planet onto the planet is kind of it's kind of a cool concept. That I think is executed nicely. Um, but, so yeah, I think ultimately I don't dislike that part section of the record as much as I used to, and I kind of appreciate it a little bit more. I love the way that he really goes for it with these vocals. There are points where he just howls like a wolf, and the instrumental backing I think is suitably dramatic and silly. And then eventually this piece kind of just drifts into a, a really pretty organ lathered section that sets the tone for the irreverent uh, and silly finale of this track, which I unabashedly love, uh, which is this ridiculous, um, it's called the Sailor's Hornpipe um, section. And it's this ridiculous, fast paced, uh, looping melody that sounds like carnivalesque and silly. Um, and I just fucking love it. I think it's a really, I think it's a really irreverent and funny way to end the album. And I adore it. I, I like the way that Mike manages to, because basically what Mike is doing with this record is kind of pretentious -y. Like it's very showy. Like he, he knows he's a musical genius basically. And he wants to show you that by playing 20 different instruments and having them all come together. But I also think he nicely undercuts himself with some of the sillier parts of this album where he's still, gen he's still showing off his instrumental talent, but he's also doing it in a way where it's very you know it's silly and very kind of irreverent in the same way that like some of the early genesis stuff like nursery crime is and um even a bit of jethro tull as well has that same kind of sense of of levity and amongst the weight um and and it's all part of the charm of the album i think um and basically what i want to end on is whether you love this or not I absolutely urge you not to make it your last Mike Oldfield album. In a different world, this would be his difficult debut where he had to work out the kinks and then Hergus Ridge and Omidorn, the two albums that follow it, would be the household names. Uh, Omidorn was still a success and I think that it is easily his masterpiece. Uh, it's very similar in structure. Again, it's just two 20 minute pieces of a single 40 minute album that flows together as one thing. Uh, and I definitely would encourage everyone to check that out because I think that is just one of the best prog albums of the 70s. Again, very distinct from the other sort of types of prog, much more pastoral and beautiful, um, but showcases all of Mike's skills nicely. 
But Tubular Bells as an album, I think is a really interesting and funky and funny and weird uh, little thing to dive into. Uh, it's kind of baller to think that this was the success that it was, considering what it is when you sit down and listen to it. Um, it has both that kind of boomer appeal of, ah, yes, composed music in the first half, um, but also those weird sections of the first half that lots of people forget, where it goes kind of all over the place in the middle, and then it has the pastoral shit in the second part being completely railroaded by the caveman section. So, yeah, great album. I think um, its flaws are definitely real flaws and make it imperfect, but also contribute a lot to the charm of it. So that's where I'm at with it. It's a childhood classic to me, and it's nothing but endlessly funny to me that when so many people think of this record, they think of The Exorcist. That is so funny. Um, but yeah, um, that's it. I'd love to hear what other people's experiences are with this record and what the context you have and, and what it makes you feel when you listen to it. Yeah, well, the funny thing to me is that the bit everyone knows from the Exodus, the first 90 seconds, sounds nothing like the rest of it. Um, that's this really famous, or, or, although I will say that the reason that clip works so well in that scene is still representative of the reason the rest of the album is good to me. Um, there's this really famous clip that uh, Freakin for that movie got in a, a very famous uh, composer whose name I'm forgetting. Uh, and he crafted this whole suite. And when Freakin heard it, he, he tossed a chair at the composer, uh, J.K. Simpson whiplash style. Um, basically shouting, who is this pretentious cunt? Um, and so it was getting really close then. They had no score. William Freakin heard the first 90 seconds of this and he said, you know, that's it. The fact is that those first 90 seconds are like glacial and chilling. And that's why they work in the scene. But they're also weird and off kilter and strange. Mm. Yeah. It's you kind know, of a it, melody that seems to kind of start in the middle of itself and loops mm -hmm. around in a really unconventional way. I would just like to jump in and say that I think if this hadn't appeared in The Exorcist, this would still be like an iconic album opening, this part. I, yeah, I think it's it's, icon it's iconic to me. It, it sounds so immediately classic. Yes. It, it would be iconic uh, in everywhere but America. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's almost definitely true. Um, I mean, look, this album is sort of big enough to have like famous fans of it in the UK who'd never seen The Exorcist, you know. Um, but the, you know, think about what's happening in that scene in the movie and you have um, this out of place lady overhearing uh, a priest who is also a psychiatrist confess that he thinks he's lost his faith. Um, and this is the start of, and of course, like the arc of the movie in the clip that was cut, but then restored is uh, revealed to be that the possession is not to target the mother, but the priests, because the main character has lost his faith. So Reagan is possessed in order to confront him with evil. Um, and so you are here at the confession that launches the plot of the movie. And you have this music that is the start of a 20-minute suite of quite staggering proportions. Um, and it, so this is what I mean when I say the reason it works in that scene is the reason it works on the record, even though as soon as it's done, the record starts to sound completely different. Um, and the thing is, it's very strange to me that this was a hit because it is two 20-minute long suites. And that's not what I think of when I think of music that your mum has in a record collection. But it is certainly true that so much uh, music that we take for granted, so obviously influenced by this record, um, just for a start, the use of lengthy pieces that use repetition to build and build and build, really obviously influenced where post-rock would end up going. Um, but then just how this influenced the rest of British prog rock is so obvious in the way it blends different genres and shifts between ideas and sounds. Um, 
this is uh, I didn't, but um, in the end, it's very difficult for me to take notes. What ended up happening was when um, I listened to the second half today, I, I just like just jammed on my bass guitar to it for a bit instead of taking notes. And I can tell you right now, the biggest compliment I can give to this record is at least for the first half where it's using this repetitive motif of uh, going up a scale of majors to a minor scale at the top and then going back down and repeating. Um, it is jamming along with my bass guitar to that is one of the singular most joyous experiences I've had in my music playing career of just riding this delirious, sonorous, musically joyous uh, section of music. Um, it helped me actually realize um, what this song does musically in interesting ways in ways I wouldn't have picked up on. Um, because when you play along to a song, you're thinking about it in terms of how you match what it's doing musically. So you end up thinking about it on more of a fundamental musical level. So there are moments where not only does the tempo change, but the key changes in ways I'd never picked up on before. How, like, um, really subtly, there are obviously really obvious moments in part two where it does that, but there are way more subtle moments that people aren't going to pick up on. Um, and that's really the best compliment I can give, that this is just two sets of, two, two sides of the coin that complement each other really well, that are both incredibly interesting and joyous musically and sonorous and harmonious. They do incredibly daring things and are chimeric and they change aesthetics, but are always coherent until it ends with a poker 30 second stretch. Um, but I will take it. <laughs> um, I fully believe that there are my Goldfield records that are better um, because um, as much as it does hit climaxes of brilliance, um, well, it takes a little bit to get there at points. Um, but the fact that this guy made this so young is crazy. The fact that he had the confidence to make this at the age he did just makes me feel jealous, frankly. Like, how, how dare you? <laughs> I got a lot out of this record and I will listen to more of his music um, and again you wouldn't hear the famous clip of it and think this is a classic prog record but you listen to the whole record and it just obviously is Baller Yeah it's definitely like, like I don't definitely want, don't want to undermine when I, I only bring up those other records because I feel like they don't get talked about enough, but like, I don't want to undermine how good I do think mm -hmm. this is. But to me, um, I do hear in this, as much as I hear moments of instant iconic musical shit that have, has gone down in the history of British progressive music and you hear interpolated all the time to the point where Mike Oldfield was, uh, was performing parts of part one at the 2012 London Olympic opening ceremony. Like mm -hmm. that has just, and also the fact that this record has two sequels as well, Tubular Bells yeah. 2 and Tubular Bells 3, released in the, both released in the 90s, which actually are better than you might think for sequel <coughs> records, but certainly are most interesting as reflections of the lasting cultural impact of this. Also, another interesting point is it has a re-recorded version in 2003. I was going to bring this up. This is yeah. weird as fuck, isn't it? Yes. The yeah. way you went about re-recording it, I mean. Oh, yeah. It's uh, it's an interesting story. But uh, would you like to get into that? Oh, sure. I just know that Oldfield is like a really, like he's a perfectionist and the way he re-recorded tubular bells is that like i can't exactly remember i don't even remember how i fucking know this but in like when he re-recorded it he did so in like like he would like lay like the tracks in the mix that are like layered onto each other is that like he did them all like as like singular things and then like layered it back over and the, he, he just went about it in the most like ridiculously complicated way he could have possibly done it just to get it like exactly specifically right what, which i what, think is the reason what he did what he, the reason why he did what he did was that he he had specific 
nitpicks with specific elements or in specific instruments and tunings on the original record. But mm. there are other parts of the record where he's like, I literally cannot improve on this. It, these parts are perfect. I don't want to alter these at all. So he kind of remade the record, but he also partially reconstructed it from pieces of the original without changing mm. them at all. So it was kind of like, he, it, it's very much that kind of, um, you know, it's kind of like a, a, a filmmaker like re-editing their movie to make a director's cut. Like even though he, even though he did basically have cr full creative freedom on the original, mm -hmm. he still kind of felt. Well, one of the complaints he had was that he felt he didn't have enough time to record the original record initially, and that after its success, he was granted more studio time that allowed him to better realize his subsequent records. Whereas the first one, it was kind of rushed him having to record all these different instrumental parts in a short amount of time. Uh, so that was part of it but also just the fact it was, it's really kind of like perfectionist stuff like you say like to me i don't think oh, the 2003 bells 2003 which i've only heard once i don't think it sounds measurably better than the original to be honest i don't have really see any of the particular issues that he's spoken on in the original like i have particular issues with the way certain parts of it are constructed and fit together but they're not particularly things that he addresses and the remake anyway so it's just a, an artifact and I, I to a certain extent i think oldfield is a genuine artist and i think he did this because he, he he remade the record because he genuinely wanted to take advantage of this opportunity to fix certain things but also at the same time this is this record that has this legacy of like two sequels uh, live album versions lots of different paraphernalia related to tubular bells so it like yeah like, sure he might as well fucking well. remake it as well like you know he's done he's done everything fucking else at this point you might as well just like start tooling around with the original why not um so yeah it's i don't particularly <laughs> see it as worthy of note beyond what jake says purely anecdotally although one oh. cool one cool thing is that instead of um the substantial um the person who oh, yeah. reads out mm. the um, names of the instruments at the end of part one. Instead, it's John Cleese uh, on the re-recording. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And Which... it's what what's so weird about that to me is that he couldn't, like he didn't recycle the substantial audio like <laughs> he did with so many other parts of it. He got someone entirely new to read this off. Yeah. Like just because he could, I guess. Well, I mean... Yeah. yeah basically if you I, if I you can get john cleese to be on your record in any capacity you ought to i, I will no, say I mean... um i will say definitely while i obviously strongly encourage records like hergus ridge on the dawn and amarok if you want to listen to more like mike oldfield if you do really love this album i do recommend checking out the sequel records they are surprising they're not amazing but they are surprisingly good for sequel albums that come over 20 years after the original but anyway, that's more of an aside than anything. So um, interesting uh, point of note is that, uh, I mean, obviously I had heard the Exorcist theme even before I had seen the movie, but my first conscious exposure to uh, Mike Oldfield, uh, and I didn't know that that was him. Like I, I only, I found that out much, much, much later that he was the composer of it. But my first exposure to him actually came from the video game Metal Gear Solid Five because his song Nuclear from the album Man on the Rocks is used on a radio transmission in that game. And I was like, that song slaps. Leave it to, Hide leave it to Hideo. Yeah, I was gonna say, leave it to Hideo Kojima to listen to a Mike Oldfield album that by and large looks to be his worst on aggregate sites that nobody remembers. And then I'm just like, yeah, I'm gonna use this in my fucking video game swan song thing. And then it's just like, yeah, yeah, fucking, this is oh, a Hideo Kojima I, I, thing. I, I was like, man, what? I've never heard of this yeah. album. And then I uh -huh. look it up and it came out in 2014. So no wonder I haven't heard of it. Yep. I listened um, to all my Mike Oldfield records when game. I was- <laughs> Little kid. That game is set in like 1985. Yep, sure <laughs> is. Uh, and uh, this the song is very uh, good, he's... but uh, I haven't listened to the whole album. Uh, but that was my first exposure to him. So then when I found out, I was just like, when people are like, oh, you know, the Exorcist theme is not the Exorcist theme. It's this fucking thing that's like this 
big old it's this long thing called two year bells and then i found out it was mike oldfield and i was like oh it's fucking that guy so i'm like that's the first time anyone has ever made that connection in that order probably yes uh yeah so i was just like i've, I've always had this pressure into my mind but now i was you know it was the first time i was gonna listen to it just because it's one of those things that like you know everybody has those musical things it's like yes i i know of this thing that is super famous that lots of people talk about and i've never listened to it uh so i did uh, and yeah, I, I think it's a really impressive piece of work. I, I think the layering and production of it is like, you know, I am obvious, I, I don't have the ear for production that Mr. Oldfield has, and I haven't heard the different uh, recording of it, and I trust Tyler's instincts for it to not be different at all. Um, that said, I, I, to my ears, this sounds really goddamn good, like just a fucking pristine recording of, of everything here. Uh, it's, you know, I, it's funny when I listen to this in the context of itself and not in The Exorcist, because truth be told, I never really liked the song's placement in that movie. It, it just always came out of nowhere so for weird. me tonally, and it just disappears, and you're just kind of like, huh, I mean okay i wouldn't have made that choice but all right i mean i love the movie so who gives a shit but I, I, that was always are, just real. i i don't care blah 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 you are but, right yeah. but at the same time in order to get into why i disagree it would take us into the wrong kind yeah of which is why i said i don't care my yeah. point is <laughs> listening to it in the context right. of the actual album is quite different because it builds on this progression very, very substantially throughout the first part of it with lots of different layered instrumentation. And you kind of hear it evolve and grow and then eventually it kind of disappears out of the mix. And by the time it's gone, the song is it's something entirely different. And that's basically the name of the game here is that it's just this constantly shifting, evolving, progressive thing. And I don't really think that like, I, I wouldn't call this like, yeah, it's a progressive album, like in spirit, but it's like kind of hard to recommend as like a progressive rock, progressive thing album to people. I feel like is just like- I feel like it, you know- I feel like it has way more in common with like classical music than yeah. like progressive. Rock, totally really and, and it, like, it's just kind of like you know yeah. somebody listens to wish you were here so it's like my first recommendation for that is going to be like well listen to michael field's tubular bells like and eh, not really like one-to-one -one. but like I, I i think it's a really enjoyable listen and i think that despite the fact that it's wonky structured two-part big thing it's like you know that's kind of unwieldy and then like from the outset it's not exactly looking to be super friendly in its uh approach but you know as somebody who listens to a lot of music that's you know big long you know we talked about a godspeed album today uh you know it's paced really really well um it doesn't outstay its welcome but it also doesn't feel too scant um really my only thing to note here is that's just different from what other people have said so far is that I'm just, there are just more sections of this that work for me than and other, and there are other sections that just kind of don't, uh, particularly the second half, there's that part in the middle there, which, uh, the game band uh, section. yeah, I, I don't, I don't much care for it. It almost sounded like it, it, it was like somebody inserted lo-fi black metal screams into the back of the mix. <laughs> it was just kind of like, what the fuck? <laughs> and like, you know, good bit lasts a bit long for my liking, but, uh, and also just the fucking, the end of the first one when it's just like, bells. <laughs> it's like, that doesn't impact my enjoyment, but it's just really silly. And like the record is kind of silly in points. So it like, it doesn't take itself too seriously. So it's not that big of a deal, but it's a bit immersion breaking just because there are parts of it that are really like meditative and parts of it that are really like atmospheric and you enjoy that. And then suddenly like if a thing like that so, like breaks in, it's like, it's a bit eh, like, I, I don't know, maybe I, I, maybe I'm just the fucking killjoy advocating for this album to be a little bit more self-serious, but like, I don't know, the consistency I would have admired, it probably would have led to a slightly more enjoyable listen. I'm not going to mark it down too many points from what I would normally just because of these things, because they are relatively small in the grand scheme of things, but I think it's an impressive composition. It's easy to see how it was influential. It's easy to see how a lot of people like, I, I guess it's definitely, like Sarah said, you know, it's not like this thing that like, you know, you could see your mom having on fucking vinyl, like kind of blue, but it's just kind of like, 
I don't know. It, it, it's progressive in a way that I feel might be unfriendly in length, but also just if you were going to play someone like an outsider who wasn't super familiar with this kind of stuff, and you're just like, hey, if you've got this amount of time to kill, listen to this. And th I could see, you know, your average Joe kind of enjoying it just because it does sound pretty good. Uh, but yeah, it, it, it works more, much more often than it doesn't. It's really impressive. Uh, it's easy to see its influence. And I'm glad I sit down and finally listen to it. Uh, and it does make me want to check out more of Mike's stuff, especially with Tyler's recommendation. I, that's pretty much the, the, the name of the game here is that I was just like, oh, maybe he's just the guy who made tubular bells and then a bunch of other shit no one cares about. So now I have validation to actually seek that out because the only other thing I know about him is he made fucking that one album, but nobody likes it. But yeah, it's, it's, it's very good. I enjoyed it. Yeah. Uh, fucking... Uh, Mike Oldfield's Tubular Bells. Exorcist, yada yada. Okay, heard it there. Uh, I was like, this is neat. Uh, I think it's in like the the me the melody that everybody remembers is in like two bars, and one of them is like seven eight time signature, and then the one after that is eight eight. So that's cool. Never heard it before. Uh, we were doing this record club. And I was like, well, I can't say I can't say this is what I expected, but, you know, cool, which is just just kind of the rest of the record almost reminds me of like a ballet or something like a Tchaikovsky <laughs> symphony yeah. or something. Um, it does feel very classical and presentation in that way. And I, I enjoyed much of it. it felt like the sort of the. Uh, sort of cheeky parts were appropriately cheeky and amusing and the the parts where there's like just really ambitious compositions that continually uh, build on themselves in interesting ways were really great too um i honestly don't have much in depth to say uh everyone's done a pretty great job of that so far anyhow um uh, what I will say is that, you know, because um, there, there are two things, really. Uh, and one of them is me being a nitpicky guitar bitch, as usual. Um, because you can tell that this guy is a multi-instrumentalist in the, in the way that the guitar playing is kind of wildly inconsistent. Like, sometimes it sounds like really great, like really on point. And other times it's like, man, you just kind of noodle in here. Like, I guess, I guess that's, that's fine when you're like really damn good at noodling, but it feels like you are more comfortable with having a structure to this shit. So maybe you could have, I don't know, like, <sighs> I would have appreciated more structure in, the guitar soloing at certain points. Um, the other thing uh, has nothing to do with me being a nitpicky guitar bitch. So that segment's done. Um, is this definitely does feel like a first album? Um, I, I, it's like, but it's the kind of first album where it's like, this is all the shit that I've been cooking up for the whole time that I've been playing music. So here is literally all of it. Um, and you know, not in a first album in the way it's like, oh, we're just getting warmed up here. Although there's just a little baby bit of that. There's uh, also worth mentioning on that note that there was obviously um, no real idea of how the, whether this record would be successful or not. So I think what you're saying is really apt and accurate because genuinely, I would have, I would imagine that Mike had no idea whether he'd even get to make another record let alone how difficult it was to get this, like, to get someone to sign this and, and, and release it. So, yeah, there's definitely a sense of, of really throwing everything in there with it that I think gets finessed in, in the next few records that he does. Yeah. Um, it, it goes without saying that this is a fucking impressive debut album. Um but I do think it is worth mentioning that it is kind of 
all over the place and a little rough around the edges. And that might be part of the appeal. Um, but not as much for myself. Um, yeah. Nothing nothing too wildly in-depth, but I enjoyed my time with this a fair bit. Makes right. the good sound. Well, to kind of uh, potentially close this out, I will, of course, speak of this record now. Uh, of course, yeah, the first... The first track, Tubular Bells, part one. I yeah, Why did I say that? No shit. It's, uh, anyways. Um, <laughs> so I, I really do love the way this opening melody is like shattered by these like intense piano hits that boom. Yeah. It's, mm-hmm. it's this really great way. And I, to like get you into the album. And I think in a way it's, it's become kind of a meta commentary on people's who like are familiar with this from the exorcist, how that kind of reality of what the album really is literally being shattered right before their eyes. (laughs) It's, uh, it's obviously not something he intended, but I think it's very interesting to look back upon in retrospect. Uh, I guess my favorite, my like, favorite aspect about this record oh oh, like as a whole is i love the way so many of these instruments just sound like the dedication to just the creating the most like i like interesting sound with each instrument to like play off of each other i think is really cool like tyler mentioned the the really punky guitars on here which are an absolute standout feature. I love the way those sound. They've got this really intense dynamic that gives so much, so much drive to the first part on here. Um, there's this like, and yeah, it does. It does feel a little scattershot at points, perhaps a little messy, but I think yeah, that. But I think that ultimately contributes to like how out of the gate and fresh this feels well fresh for 1973 when it was released but i digress uh how fresh it feels i think it gives it a real that that messiness almost gives it like an urgency as as the point was kind of being made earlier that it it is in and of itself kind of the appeal of what's going on here i find it really interesting I, I absolutely love the closing part to the first uh, to the first uh, kind of half of this album. That that ending progression is just like seeing seeing God. It's beautiful. It is this overwhelming, overpowering thing. And I really do love the sense of humor this record has because I think I've I've made it a great point that what I value a lot in music is not being too self-serious and having, being able to have some fun with yourself. And I think Old Field Across this like mostly instrumental record is able to do that really well, convey this sense of both shifting playfulness and seriousness with what he's putting together here. I think that's a really interesting dynamic to listen for how that shifts throughout these songs, particularly on the second half of this where that silliness is much more upfront with the ending kind of circus bit, which reminded me of uh, the Between the Buried and Me song with the polka breakdown. I knew you were gonna bring that up, hell yeah. Uh, but it, it has that same energy to it that it's very it's this silly odd choice that I think really works in terms of the memorability of what's going on here and yeah it's Tyler currently imploding <laughs> I mean I'm just thinking about how this is a much more successful execution of that kind of irreverence than the polka thing for me. But I wasn't going to say that out loud, but then you just kind of started talking at me. So there it is. Well, it was written all over your face. Fucking thinking it. It was written all over your face, darling. So (laughs) You with the wine? Who the fuck are you, Cole? (laughs) This thing like a head of Elector (laughs) asked. Oh, yes, my, my my fizzy brown wine. 
Yeah. You stole fizzy lifting drinks. <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's the um, first time, Morgan, that you've ever had what I could describe as coal energy. <laughs> yeah. That's true. Yeah, this this sounds really good. Oh, that's... I like how Morgan and I are drinking the exact same drink. And mm-hmm. so I... you're only going after Morgan. It's the, the, the wavelengths are being achieved. It's the record. It's bringing us together. Tubular. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, man. Tubular. Tubular. Sweet, man. So yeah, uh, should we get into (laughs) ratings with this? Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. Um, Jake, three favorite tracks. My three favorite tracks are um, oh gosh, I don't know, um, the light, the light part two. It's already and stopped buzz being cut. Funny. It's already stopped being funny. <laughs> like, go fuck yourself then. I'll get my rating <laughs> after you. No, fair enough. I walked into that. Um, I'll, we'll go. We, so we're going backwards then. Yeah, I don't fucking sure. care. I just want to stick it to you. Okay. Um, well, <laughs> well, you definitely do that from the behind then. <laughs> okay. Uh, right. uh, eight out of ten. I, my favorite track is The Glow Part 2. What did and... I just say? <laughs> <laughs> oh, turn this car around, so help me God. We just, Jake and I just had a bitch fight <laughs> because of this fucking joke. I thought you were making a different joke, I'm sorry. Tyler's um... turning into Tony Collette in the film Little Miss Sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god, and I'm Steve Carell. Um, this is a record I'm giving an 8.5 out of 10. Bad. Um, my favorite track is Automata Part 2 by Between the Parrot and Me. <laughs> oh, fucking see myself <laughs> out now. Um, 8 out of 10. Nice. <laughs> Slap it with an 8 out of 10. Yeah, it's cur- big, uh, big uh, standard deviation on this one, huh? What's Huge. Jake's right? No, seven. Oh, look, it got bigger. Uh, oh, well, yeah, so oh, too soon. Yeah, it did. That's a 7.9 on average. I've already done that in the last episode, we'll do it again. So, between the buried and me, uh, Saturday Night Wrist, addicted, all relevant records. Have a good day. Because it's all shit. Saturday Night watch. Wrist, definitely not a relevant record, but. <laughs> <laughs> so let us know what you think of Tubular Bells by Mike Oldfield. What is your history with this record? Um, what's your favorite Mike Oldfield record, if it's not this one? Um, and yeah, so let us know your opinions in the comments. Next week's Record Club episode is going to be on another classic album, this time from the 90s. We'll be talking about Massive Attack's Blue Lines. So stick around for that. And yeah, rock over London. Rock on Chicago. Rock on Chicago. De Beers. A diamond is forever.